What I aim to do in this uh, session is address uh, the question, um, is there a crisis in subjects? My argument is that there's a growing crisis, at least in the area of the curriculum usually called the humanities, which includes geography, despite the fact that geography also crosses into the sciences, as you know. Uh, my talk will attempt to explain that point of view. I shall also suggest that just because the government now talks up subjects, including geography, that doesn't mean the crisis is over. Mr Gove said on Tuesday, uh, I think the problem has been that over the last 13 years, teaching as a profession has had the initiative, the fun, the enjoyment uh, squeezed out of it. Good, I was glad to hear him say that. Uh, but I'm not sure the white paper addresses the particular problem that I will, I hope, um, uh, emerge from my talk. Namely, how to support subject specialists develop as curriculum makers in a way that's driven by ambitious, intelligent goals and which pays serious attention to subject disciplines uh, such as my own. So over the next 25 minutes, I shall definitely say something about geography. You wouldn't expect anything less. Um, but I'm also going to analyse the circumstances that argue strongly for a return to knowledge, which is, I think, what part of the white paper is trying to do. Thirdly, I want to encourage and reaffirm a belief and I guess I would share this with uh, Bob Geldof, of all people, in a liberal, open, progressive education which draws from the vocabulary and the grammar of subject disciplines. And finally, I want to try and emphasise the opportunity that now exists in a trimmed down essentials curriculum, which we understand is coming our way, to allow teachers to develop as curriculum makers. And I'll try and explain what I mean by that uh, later on. Geography is the world's subject. Um, and as Michael Palin once said, what could be more important than that? Um, geography, I think, uh, introduces children to uh, a lifelong conversation about themselves on planet Earth. And to repeat, what could be more important than that? Uh, it begins, perhaps, uh, in wonder. Uh, look at the expression, if you can see them, on the faces of those children. They're doing field work in an unfamiliar place. And it definitely seems to have captured their attention. And I think, as I'll say later, there are some fundamental curiosities children have about themselves in the world. Uh, geography certainly contributes to learning about that. And geography can take us to more complex um, and deeper issues uh, about place, identity uh, and context and perhaps conflict. And this slide, one of my favourites from the GA's current uh, manifesto, which uh, I've already mentioned in passing a different view. Um, shows that person, I think that's on a busy train station in Utrecht. But that person wondering where she is, what her next steps are. It seems to me to kind of symbolise, it's sort of a metaphor for geography uh, and that search for understanding. So that's my take, very briefly, on geography for the moment, and I will come back to some geography later on in my talk. But the image of subjects, the image that subjects have um, in school, in the media, in political discourse, doesn't quite match that excitement and level of curiosity I was trying to put over. Seems to me that there's an enduring image of schools and subjects in particular, which might be symbolised by that slide. Enduring images of teachers who talk too much, of classrooms that are sort of um, prisons, and of subjects 
who some leading academics will argue are 19th century creations and have therefore, the conclusion is nothing to do with the 21st century. Well, let me tell you, geography is a lot older than the 19th century. A geography is an ancient idea. It's part of um, humanity's uh, big thinking. Geography, it literally means earth writing. The ambitious project that'll never end of trying to describe and explain ourselves on the earth. But nevertheless, I think to some extent, subjects in schools are saddled with this, this image problem. Now, as you know, QCA uh, addressed this with their uh, work on the futures. And this is a quote from their futures document some time ago. The UK has moved from a manufacturing economy to a service and knowledge-based economy. In an increasingly technological world, jobs migrate. In an uncertain future, we need people who are flexible and equipped to learn and adapt. We are so familiar with that idea. We could go to the OECD, talking about 21st century skills, quote, for jobs that have not yet been created, using technologies that have not yet been invented to solve problems that cannot be foreseen. Another very well-known quote. I was on a website dedicated to education recently, about two weeks ago, which quoted that and described it as silly, which I was quite interested about. The reason being, does that quote assume that we're the only generation that has had to prepare for unknown things? I don't think so. But it does raise the question, is there anything special about our current circumstances? And then Mick Waters himself, the architect of the 2008 National uh, Curriculum Key Stage 3, um, in a rather gushing profile of him in The Guardian in September, he was quoted as saying, a school shouldn't start with the curriculum content. It should start with designing a learning experience and check it has met the national curriculum requirements. I think that quote is really revealing. It seems to refer to knowledge as inert, as given, as untroublesome, as just stuff that you list in a document somewhere and you audit your teaching against. That's nothing to do with the vision that I've started to paint about my own discipline in geography, uh, this search for meaning. And I think Mick Waters in that quote is just plain wrong. If a school doesn't start with the content, what does it start with? So I wonder whether these quotes that I've just gone through are not so much describing our present circumstances, but actually part of establishing a sort of an ideology. Some people would call this uh, a neoliberal ideology or orthodoxy. And the geographer, uh, an Australian geographer called Wadley, uh, wrote a, a really unusual article uh, a couple of years ago. It was called The Garden of Peace, which I'll come back to in a moment. The Garden of Peace, he said, exists, or could exist, maybe should exist, in what he called the vibrant city. The vibrant city is his metaphor for our current times. This 24-hour culture, the just-in-time culture, the work longer, the work harder, compete, compete, compete culture we live in. It never stops. And um, he was saying that accepting that sort of ideology has in a way dulled our ability to think for and beyond ourselves. Now for me, and this might be a bit challenging I, I guess, I think part of this is creating almost a fetish of learning. We talk about uh, learning in almost hallowed terms. And I th but I think this, this ideology, this current state we're in, 
perhaps epitomised by, by Mick's quote, um, makes a fetish about learning which I, I find troublesome. It treats learning as a good thing in itself. So learning, in, in a way, is value-free. Value it's just good. But of course it is not. Learning can be trivial, it can be dangerous, it can be wrong. It also treats learning as an essentially scientific or technical process. Thus, we say that with the correct techniques, learning can be accelerated. As if th this were a good thing in itself, in itself. But of course, understanding aspects of science or geography or history or English or art can be counterintuitive and require really sustained and sometimes painstaking effort dealing with the ideas of those disciplines. And it also treats learning as paramount. So teaching becomes subservient to or led by the learning. So we become almost embarrassed by teaching and instead only talk about facilitating learning. And you could argue that a society that abrogates responsibility in that way uh, may be one that has truly lost confidence in itself. Have we nothing we want to teach young people? So I'm wondering whether we have, in this rush, um, thrown the baby out with the bathwater or risk doing it. And some subjects may be at some more risk than others in this way. Here's a quote from Guy Claxton from his Building Learning Power um, website. And I've highlighted a couple of words in red there to make a point about how tendentious this, this argument can be. Guy writes, there is no evidence that being able to solve simultaneous equations or discuss the plot of Hamlet equips young people to deal with life. We have lazily assumed that somehow it must do, but research shows that even successful students are often left timid and unsettled when they step outside the narrow comfort zones of their academic success. I'd like to know what the research is that shows that. I, I think that's really quite tendentious. And it's inviting us to drop subject knowledge somehow and just concentrate on these skills. Now, we could take a lot from Claxton's idea of building learning power, and, and he does remind us of the broader purposes of education, no doubt about that. But I wonder whether there is a danger of throwing the baby out with the bathwater uh, in this way. Now, people like me, um, because, well, I caught Bob Geld off last night, and as he went through his name-checking, he seems to know everyone who's a rock star, um, he mentioned um, uh, Gordon Sumner as uh, another example of someone who escaped being a teacher uh, by becoming Sting, the rock star. Uh, and he was a geography teacher, apparently. Um, well, I haven't escaped teaching and I haven't escaped geography, and I've always, almost made a career arguing for it. And in the face of Guy Claxton and this orthodoxy that I've been describing, my challenge is to make counter-arguments that will carry weight. And the way I see it, we must avoid swinging pendulums. And the problem with the white paper uh, that's trying to return to knowledge is that we see it as somehow a great big swing of the pendulum back to knowledge. There are false dichotomies all over the place. Knowledge versus skills, why not have them together? Curriculum versus pedagogy, why not have them together? In fact, they're different and they need to go together. New versus old, everything that's old ain't wrong and everything that's new ain't right. And what I never do is just defend my subject for itself. I think that is indefensible. You can't just make a, 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 a defense of geography as a good thing in itself. I'll come back to that. What we must do is promote teachers as the ultimate skilled boundary workers. They need to deal with subject knowledge, but they need to deal with a lot more besides, and I'll come back to that. 
We need to promote subject disciplines not as ends in themselves, but as resources that teachers use uh, for educational ends and purposes. And we definitely need to get back involved with knowledge. Um, we need, I think, to develop a theory of knowledge. And Michael Young, um, a sociologist of education, would definitely argue that. His 2008 book called Bringing Knowledge Back In uh, makes the arguments. To summarise very complicated arguments, I think what Michael Young tries to tell us is that schools are very special places, and they're special places partly because they have a duty to introduce young people to material, to experiences, yes, but to knowledge that they just won't encounter otherwise. Not at the home, not in Tesco's, not from the internet, not from the TV. They are very special places. Because they induct young people into what he calls powerful knowledge. Not simply knowledge of the powerful, but powerful knowledge. The example he often gives is, why have young people discussing, say, HIV AIDS in Southern Africa in science lessons when we haven't quite yet established what a virus is? And that understanding is, of, of a virus is powerful because it underpins uh, the quality of that debate that will follow. Um, and Young also makes a clear distinction between curriculum which is the what question, from pedagogy, which is more the how question. And schools need, and teachers need to be involved with that what question. What am I teaching? What am I trying to teach? And why? I could spend the next hour with you, at least, with that single slide illustrating powerful knowledge and a geographical point of view, but I don't think I've got time. But if you look at a, a landscape like that and try and interpret it, you will know there's this material, there are facts, there is knowledge that helps us make sense of that. The soil, the chalk that's underneath that escarpment we're looking at, the origin of that building we're looking at, the kind of crops that are being grown, where, where is that car going from and to? What lies behind that tree line? Well, it's a dual carriageway and a fast rail link to London. There is certain knowledge that helps us piece together a story in that landscape. But knowledge alone is not enough. Ideas such as rurality, development, environment, interrelationships also help us build a conceptual understanding of what that place might be, what it is, what it might become. It's a geographical way of looking at a scene. And in the GA's manifesto, uh, we try and identify what we mean by thinking geographically. It's not the same as thinking historically or artistically or scientifically. And an educational outcome of teaching and learning geography, is for young people to apply knowledge and conceptual understanding to new settings, to think geographically about a changing world. And what our manifesto also argues, and once again, that's one of the images from the manifesto, I bet you can identify where that is, I'll ask later. We talk about the vocabulary of the subject and when Kai talked about the uh, capitals of the world, I would definitely argue that that is part of the vocabulary of geography. And it's not trivial, and it's not insignificant. But just as you're learning a language, just learning a list of vocabulary is certainly not enough. Just knowing a lot of German words doesn't enable you to speak German. You need the grammar too. And in learning a discipline, just the words are not enough you need the grammar. And vocab the vocabulary for me is the metaphor. It's not exact, it doesn't work totally, but, but it's a metaphor for um, what the government are beginning to talk about as core knowledge in their stripped-down essentials curriculum. And I think we shouldn't reject that. 
We shouldn't say this is something about going back to the 1950s or something. I say embrace it. Because no one says it is the curriculum. Not the government, no one said it is the curriculum. Um, a curriculum contains much more besides, including working with this troublesome stuff, the conceptual understanding. So at the GA, what we've been trying to do is work on an idea of expressing the, the broad goals and purposes of geography education using an idea that is beginning to gain weight in many fields, including education, which is capability. It, once again, interestingly, um, Bob Gelf, Gel, Geldof used the term himself. I haven't got time to give the origins of capability, but you can, you can stretch it right back to the Nobel Prize winning economist, development economist, Amartya Sen, um, and his work. What we're going to try and argue is that in geography, capability of an individual student, their capabilities are enhanced by an acquisition and development of what we're calling world knowledge, for want of a better term. And I think that, again, can be equated with core knowledge, the essential knowledge, the enabling knowledge of the vocabulary of the subject. But secondly, learning geography consistently over a period of time develops interrelational understanding. For example, being able to grasp global interdependence and its significance and the idea of a global sense of place. None of us can understand the world without having that perspective. And thirdly, and finally, a propensity to think through all sorts of adventurous pedagogic technique and activities about how places, societies, environments are made, how they continue to be made, and what they may become. And it seems to me that put those three together and you have a profound reason for taking the subject seriously. None of those things will happen by accident. And I'm arguing that they should drive the teaching. So get back to Wadley's vibrant city, um, where he said, or what he was arguing for, were spaces which he called a garden of peace. Oh, here's a garden of peace. Um, I think the metaphor kind of works well for schools and classrooms. To what extent can we in, in schools organise spaces for young people to be able to think deeply and to deliberate with some difficult stuff? Um, these are questions, those two and the two that follow, that I've just ripped off from Howard Gardner in an article, uh, he's the Harvard psychologist, the inventor of multiple intelligences. And Howard Gardner, in, in, um, in an article about subjects, um, identified four, four bundles of questions which he argued were fundamental curiosities that children have. Who am I? Where am I from? Who is my family? What's their story? And who are these people around me and where do they come from? So all, the, all those questions are about identity. And then questions about society. Who decides on who gets what, where and why? And what is fair? And why should we care? Those are great questions. And I'm not arguing that only geography can address those questions, but geography does have something to say about those questions, as other disciplines do. Here's another garden of peace and another bundle of questions. Questions about the physical environment. These are really great. What is the world and this place, this place we're at now, what is it made of? Why do things move? And then what becomes of things? Those are really fundamental questions. And if, and if we address those questions, we're understanding about uh, how the physical world is made. And what about our place in the world? Where do I live? Uh, what does it look like? How is it changing? 
how might it become? And one of the things that's occurred to us um, at the GA uh, over recent years is, is that geography is, is perhaps the subject in the curriculum which does allow itself to think about the future. Uh, as I said earlier, through decision-making exercises and so on and so forth. Now, those are fundamental questions in which um, um, young people need to, as it were, be given space and time and a particular set of circumstances uh, to pursue. And I think that's what classrooms are for and what um, uh, subjects are for. Now, in terms of the curriculum that's coming, um, we're told that we're going to have a stripped-down essentials curriculum, and this is going to free up time. I've argued that we should embrace this idea of core knowledge, um, but not mistake it for the curriculum. I think what's coming is that teachers uh, need to see themselves much more as curriculum makers. Not leaders solely of teaching and learning, but of curriculum as well. And this is what I mean by that. Um, basically, and this ain't rocket science, as someone once said, there are three bundles of energy in, in the classroom. I think we can, teachers certainly need to tune into student experiences and student energy, and, it, and also have a pretty deep understanding about how children learn. That's really important. But teachers also have to have that engagement with the subject, an understanding of the discipline, its principles, and what the discipline is about, what it's trying to achieve. And of course, uh, teachers also need to have all sorts of craft knowledge. Interesting that uh, Mr. Gove talks about craft knowledge a lot in terms of teacher training. But my argument would be, if that's all we're doing with teachers, allowing them to develop craft skills, we are selling them down the river. More to the point, we're selling the children down the river, because there's much more uh, to the enterprise than just teaching. The, the, the pedagogy, if you like, uh, choices about how to chunk material, how to sequence it, and so on. Now, somehow, teachers need to deal with all that together. This is why I was talking about them as uh, boundary workers. <coughs> Student learning, pedagogy, and the subject. And somehow, I think curriculum making is captured by this idea that uh, we're going for uh, appropriate learning activities, um, we've got a good concept of what we mean by thinking geographically or historically or scientifically and so on. And it's underpinned by ideas as well as informed by core knowledge. And this is the, I think, the Michael uh, Young point. It takes children forward to beyond what they already know. Um, in a deep sense. So, teachers as curriculum makers. It seems to me, what I've been trying to argue, is that over uh, recent years, um, there's been a lack of balance and a lack of attention to the deep thought, the intellectual work, that has to underpin curriculum makers. Perhaps we've been too dazzled by the teaching bit of that. And I do have uh, information from uh, Ofsted and others, particularly teacher trainers, people who will say to me, look, the, the technical teaching is great, but the geography is just dodgy. And that's, I think, because people aren't engaged with the what question, the curriculum question. Put this another way, I think in recent years, I think we've been probably dazzled by the technology. 
This is a real sign that uh, somewhere in uh, West Norfolk. Um, if, if we're over-dependent upon the technology, oh, let me say it, if we're over-dependent upon what, what we're told by the national strategies, let's say, we stop thinking for ourselves. And if you're over-dependent upon the sat-nav, as you know, um, usually it will get you to where you want to go, usually. But even if it does, think of all the stuff you've missed on the way, because you don't, actually don't know how you've got to your destination. You've just got to your destination. You just followed the sat-nav. And I think we've got to resist that and avoid ending up at the locked gate at the far end uh, and take back uh, this intellectual work which I'm putting under the heading of curriculum making. And just to finish, um, I refer back to uh, the, the point I made right at the beginning. I don't see much in the white paper. There's a lot to be interested and applaud probably in the white paper, but I don't see much in the white paper to help me understand how teachers, subject specialist teachers, are going to be supported and challenged um, with the subject knowledge thing. I mean, and that, that goes right back to the very start of initial training. Just having a geography degree does not mean you've got the subject knowledge with which you need to teach. The geography degree is really helpful, but it doesn't prepare you to teach. You've still got to engage with this thing called geography. Um, and I wonder where that support is coming from if teacher training is reduced in length and if trainees are solely in schools. I've got nothing against that in principle except for the one question. How do you get that subject knowledge input? How do schools provide really challenging, exciting opportunities for subject specialists? You might only have two geographers in your school. How do you put on school-based inset which then really does supply uh, the subject knowledge needs? It's very difficult, and I don't see anything in the white paper that's really uh, addressing that. What I would say, though, I hope, yeah, is that you can join the GA. <laughs> um, if you're interested in, in the, the manifesto, how we're trying to express geography, it's easy enough to find. Um, and, of course, we do lots more besides. And it would be nice to think that every school in the country uh, has some sort of attachment with that subject association and other subject associations too. Um, we know our reach is pretty extensive, but it's not universal. So I've given you something to do when you get back to school. And that's where I'll hold it. Thank you very much for listening. Mm.